Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Philip Ingram. Nowadays, he's a journalist and consultant, but he built a long and illustrious military career as an intelligence, counterintelligence, and security officer. Within those roles, he made a name for himself as a strategic thinker and a detailed planner. In the business world, those skills translated to make him great at setting up companies, executing mergers and acquisitions, and strategic sales plans, the scale of which often determined new directions for the companies involved. And he's managed at an executive level, consulted, and published articles about those concepts, especially related to companies in media, intelligence, security, and cybersecurity. He frequently appears on or is quoted by the BBC, CNN, ABC, and all of their offshoots, and his output is often used by Interpol. He's also a PTSD survivor, which of course brings us to our favorite cause, Save the Brave. They're a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. We invite you to read all about them at their website, savethebrave.org, and consider donating a few bucks to help them help some veterans who can use a hand. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and with recurring contributions that come right out of our PayPal accounts for a few bucks every month. And Scott Husing not only supports them, but serves on their board. They're doing great work, so I hope you'll join us in supporting them as well. Again, you can read about them at savethebrave.org. It's a great organization. We also really appreciate your support of the Break It Down show. Please do us a favor by rating us and reviewing the show. If you haven't already, it doesn't cost a dime. But if you do have a dime and you want to buy yourself a t-shirt or a hoodie, of course, we encourage you doing that and wearing your support right on your shirt. As always, if you drop us a line or a comment on a show, we'll chime in back. Seeing your comments, and especially if you share your favorite episodes like this one, it helps new listeners find us. And again, we really, really appreciate it. So we hope you'll enjoy our special guest today. Here's Philip Ingram. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Well, hey, Pete, this is Philip Ingram, and I'm really pleased to be on the Break It Down show with you today. Now, you said that we were going to drink wine. By the way, everybody, this is a Spy versus Spy episode, so I have my glass in my hand. Philip has um, his. He's in Birmingham. I'm in Orange County. Cheers, my friend. I'm, and I'm in Birmingham, the UK. Cheers, my friend. <laughs> it's good. And we're both on white today, I see. Yes, we're drinking white because we're classy spies. Hey, of course. <laughs> I love doing these episodes because, well, you know, you've done this kind of work, whether you're doing strategic or tactical level work or you're doing, you know, high end like surveillance detection or yep. or listening device countermeasures or listening device emplacement. There's so many different things to do. And every time they tell the story, they kind of combined whole teams worth of people into one impossible yep. human. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, it's it's fantastic. Um, you know, little li little known fact. Um, uh, and I think this is probably the first time that uh, this has been broadcast out there. But Daniel Craig is, uh, is married to, uh, sorry, his sister is married to my mum's half brother. There you go. <laughs> so you you want you want you want a bigger spy connection? There's one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, so you're an MBE, which I always I love that that. Uh, the British folks take time to recognize excellence and then, you know, have a rank ordering. So tell us all what an MBE is and what does that mean to you? Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's very special because it, it, it's a, it's a thank you. Um, and it's a thank you that is bestowed on you by her majesty, the queen. Um, so it's a national award, national recognition. Um, and MBE stands for member of the order of the British empire. And there's a, there's a whole range of awards on that, but um, I got it as a very junior captain, um, uh, when I was in the military as part of a planning team for um, NATO to take over the, uh, from the United Nations in Bosnia after the Dayton Peace Agreement uh, went in. And I, I was, that was probably one of the busiest jobs that I had because for the two years beforehand on, on the planning side, and I was the planning coordinator, um, it, it was a sort of 
seven o'clock in the morning in, in, into the headquarters, not out till sort of between seven and nine at night. Um, and the only difference uh, between Saturdays and Sundays was I'd go, in, I'd go into the headquarters in um, civilian clothes, not in uniform. <laughs> and, and our headquarters was, was, was based in Germany. And the, 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 the length of the longest corridor in it was a kilometer. A thousand meters. Wow. This was huge. And on a Saturday, I had to walk from one end to the other end uh, to get into the security gates to let me into my bit of it. And then completely the other way again. So it was a 2K walk once I got inside the building to get to get to my office. So I deserved a bloody MBE for that. Yeah. <laughs> you got it for walking a lot. <laughs> Walking a lot. Well, that's 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 the, that's, the, that's the official story. The unofficial story is whilst I was doing that, I was running an underground magazine. Um, and the name of the underground magazine was something that um, I derived from um, my boss, who was a U.S. one-star general, um, called Stanley F. Cherry. Stan Cherry, I'd have followed him anywhere. Brilliant, brilliant guy. But um, we were we were talking on one particular um, set of maneuvers, uh, and he he was sort of looking down at what was happening in the G3 op cell and what um, the, the, the J2 were doing and all the rest of it. Uh, and he said, Philip, they're just having a bit of a hama hama. I went, General, what's that? And he, he, he said, oh, just listen to the sound. And it was a hama 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 as everyone, as everyone was talking. I said, oh, that's good. I like, I like that, I thought. Uh, and, then, and, and I said, well, General, yeah, they're, they're sorting out the operational routine and getting everything sorted out. I said, oh, no, they're just having a frick frack. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I like that as well. <laughs> I like that as well. And, 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 and we're, ba- we're based in Germany, so German for new sheet is Blatt. So I nicknamed my underground magazine, or I called it the Hummer Hummer Frick Frack Blatt. Nice. And I, produ- I produced this as, as, as something on top of all the planning I did. Nobody knew I was the editor. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew I produced it. It was completely anonymous. It was in a multinational headquarters. We were preparing for operations, and I then deployed it in operations, and it was a huge amount of fun. So I suspect I got my MBE for actually doing that, <laughs> being, being, being a bit subversive, which most of us ex spooks are. So when you get an MBE, are you staring the queen in the face, or do you just get something in the mail? No, 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 no. You uh, get a fantastic invite down to Buckingham Palace. And it's either the Queen or because there's you know, she she gives out a few hundred a year. Um, she, she'll get um, Prince Charles involved, and she's now getting Prince William, uh, Princess Anne, uh, and others involved in, in giving them out. I think I think they're the the, the four that do it. So I, I was um, honoured to have it presented by Prince Charles. Nice. And that was well, that's we were talking twenty five years ago. So it's yeah, a long long time ago. Uh, and it's nice. For, for someone to recognize that you've put a little bit of extra effort in and to say thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. That's we have certain honors like that, but they are like, they're like, they skip all the lower ranking things and just give it to one person, you know? So we have like yeah. the Kennedy center honors and you know, that kind yeah. of thing. But, but it's neat. Yeah. That there's like different orders. So, so we can hundreds of people every year can get it. And then yeah. any, any, um, and it's any, not just for the military. It's for civilians as well. So right. you know, the, it, if you've got someone who in a particular community is, has been doing an outstanding job um, in, in some way, they can get nominated through the community. It goes up through an honor system and gets ranked and graded. And um, so, so you can get captains of industry will get some awards, but you can also get someone who has been you know, helping out with the, um, the school sports teams the last 25 years right. uh, as, a, as a volunteer and you know, they can get a nice thank you as well. And you get a, a nice day out of Buckingham Palace and um, you dress up in all your finery and go in and meet one of the major royals and um, you get presented it and they chat to you for, for a few minutes and then away you go. Good. And then any chance uh, or any hope of ever getting an OBE or bumped up all the way to commander? Well, you, you can you can get it bu- bumped up. Um, I, I found out after it had happened that it had actually been um, recommended a, f- a few more times for it. And ordinarily, um, if, they're, if they're going to get another award, you you get bumped up. But in the military, um, like, like anything, there's a, a quota. So you know, I, I, I was told afterwards that um, it had been recommended again, but because I got one, um, it was easier for them to give it to someone else so that I didn't take up one of the quotas yeah. anyway. Um, and and they, they get, they, you then just get commendations and bits and pieces. So, um, you know, it, it, it could theoretically at some stage, but um, not in the division that I've got because I'm, I'm in the military division. So I'm being ex-military now. Um, I wouldn't qualify for that. So oh, if, okay. I got, if, if I got another one, I'd have to be doing something exceptional. I'm a bit old, grey and lazy now. Um, <laughs> and um, Not nearly uh, exceptional enough. <laughs> not nearly exceptional enough there's a lot more people out there a lot more deserving 
<laughs> so give us an idea. So by the way, I also deployed uh, in 1996 as part of the Dayton Peace Accord movement by NATO. I have a, a NATO ribbon on my on my chest on my army uniform. Um, give us an idea of what your area was in intelligence and, and the things that you did. I mean, obviously, you did a lot of things in your career because that's what yep. we all do. But yeah. what would you say? What was your thing that you were best at? Well, I was I was 26 years. Um, I had two areas, I suppose, I specialized in. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll correct that. Three areas I specialized in. Um, one was intelligence planning um, and, and bringing intelligence into wider um, the military, ex-military out there will understand this J5 planning side of things, so so joint planning. Um, the second thing was uh, strategic intelligence and, and bringing that in, but the operational and tactical application of strategic intelligence, because I don't think enough people would, would, would understand that. And the third thing is uh, is, is human. Um, you know, I, I deployed a number of operations as the, the J2X, the, the, the human coordinator. Um, which is always fun. Um, being being an Irishman um, from the north of Ireland, we always like dealing with people. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll chat. I'll chat. I'll chat to anyone. And um, nine times out of ten, you 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 get stuff out of people very easily. You know, if you go and visit any little town in Ireland or any little village in Northern Ireland, by the time you've um, spent ten minutes walking down the street, at least three people who have got your full family history, why you're there, worked out um, a relative that you may or may not have in the particular area, and asked you about someone that they know in the United States. So you know, it's it's genetic for the Irish. We are good humanters. Yeah, yeah, I, I can appreciate that. The you have to have. To, okay, so so from my my point of view, my philosophy, and I want you to feel. It, uh, free to ask me questions too, because this is supposed to be an exchange. From my point of view, in terms of intelligence, on the human side, you have your yeah. your planners. You know the people that know how to yeah. put together big operations and get intel from areas. You have yeah. your analyzers, and those are the folks that have no business talking to people for the most part because they're yeah, puzzled, exactly. right? <laughs> and then you got the guys that are like, "Hey, line up the shots. We're all doing shots here. I've never met you, but you're my best friend." The guys yeah. like like me, and it sounds like like you that can talk to anybody and I don't have to pretend like I'm some, I'm just one of those people who can, and I can do the other two jobs, but where you yeah. want me is in that bar trying to find out what's going on. Yeah, exactly. So uh, were you, were you Ar army intelligence or army, army CI counterintelligence? I'm uh, 96. You must've been in with one U S armored division then um, going into Bosnia. Mm, and doing I was with the 205th MI brigade, part of the fifth Corps. Okay. Germany. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were in Germany at the same time, and the deputy commanding general of one U.S. armored division that um, uh, did that that fantastic river crossing across the Sava uh, from the north into into Bosnia that uh, should have taken two days, and I think took six weeks. Yes. Um, uh, the 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 deputy commanding general of that is, is Stanley F. Cherry, who was talking about who'd been my boss beforehand. Uh -huh. um, but planning it, so I knew, I knew General Stan very, very well indeed, and he's a real character because he'd um, he'd been blown up in Vietnam, so he'd lost um, his lower one of his lower limbs, um, and he'd had his right hand. He got um, his little finger and next finger um, blown off on his right hand, and he was the um, the ACOS. Uh, G3 operations. So there's only ever three phases to an operation because you only ever had two <laughs> fingers. Oh, yeah. There's three phases because I only got three fingers for everybody who's not following exactly. up there in podcast land. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, that, 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 that was good. It was, it was good to see him. Bosnia was um, interesting. Yeah, Dayton was interesting. It was a. I should uh, say, just, just for the audience, they can keep up. A J2X, J means joint. And that means you've got multinational forces going on. Um, you have the two, which is the code for intelligence, and X yeah. equals human intelligence. Guys like Philip and myself who go out and talk to people, as opposed to folks that look at satellite imagery or electronic and surveillance, like uh, listening to phone calls, that kind of thing. So J2X means joint intelligence, human operations kind of thing. So, okay. Uh, the J2X is an interesting job. I, I actually knew the theater uh x in iraq when i first got there i oh, okay. happened to you know just like in ireland i i met him and i'm like well i'm gonna work for this guy ultimately it would be nice to know who he is and the next thing you know and his he was an australian guy on orders to not get killed that was his joke i'm not allowed to be killed when i'm out here so and i'm like good yeah. well if you're ever interested in a drink I, I know a guy that probably could probably find some for you and and sure enough we had some drinks 
And, and this is where the story gets funny. So months and months later, uh, you know, we were working minding our own business, nowhere near headquarters, nowhere near, hundreds yeah. of miles away. And yeah. this army unit was hassling us because we were there as civilians. And they're like, hey, you have to go through the contractor gate. And so our camp had two camps together, but a bit of, of, of a red zone between it, right? So yeah. not yeah. quite one camp, it was two camps. And so to cross, you actually had to cross into an area that was frequently shot at, blown up, and they were, yeah. they were enemy out there. <laughs> and he thought he would get at us because we were contractors and he would make us go through the contractor gate. Keep in mind, I'm also interviewing all of the contractors. You know, everybody knows my face on camp because that's my job. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And so I said, there's no way in hell we're going through that gate. There's no way. And he's like, well, if you, if you don't come through in a military vehicle, you're not coming through that the, the military gate. And so the next day, <laughs> we talked our way into a Humvee. And he's like, I don't know how you guys did that. And I'm like, this is because this is what we do. And we're going to do this today. But I'm telling you right now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a hold of the 2X at theater. And he'll solve this problem for us. This is, this is yep. not a problem yeah. I need to solve. And he's yeah. like, okay, whatever. And so I'm like, so are you saying that we're allowed to come in this gate or do we have to go through the con? Because the contractor gate for everybody listening is a long queue with water trucks, people from different, con- all kinds of things are exposed to, to danger. It's primarily Iraqis in this line. By the way, within months of this happening, a guy blew himself up in the chow hall on this camp. So yep. you're trying to keep very dangerous people out of the camp. I'm not dangerous like that. So, um, the next day, he stopped us and said, we're not allowed to come on the camp anymore, you know, unless we go through that gate. And so I called the 2X, and I'm like, hey, man, I got a bit of a problem. And he's like, what's your problem? And I explained it, and he's like, I have been dying for a reason to get out of headquarters. And you know how this is. If you work way up yes. high. Yes. Yep. And Any so excuse. <laughs> he came down and enlightened that major as to what was going to happen from now on. <laughs> and that major came back and was like, why did you guys do that to me? Like we told you, we worked <laughs> like for core. <laughs> we told you, but um, and it's not the big time the guy, but it's just you know our work is already dangerous enough without having some low it, 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 hem us oh, up, it is, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's it's hugely dangerous, and and, and people don't understand it. Uh, interesting as as as, as J two X. I don't know whether this is the same in the, the the U S Army, but a lot of people try to pretend that they're not intel. They're they're running around the place. I was one of these people that I would wear my intelligence core berry. I'd have my um, rank slides on, said intelligence core on them and all the rest of it. So I'd put myself as the public face of what was going on because I had plenty of people that were out there agent handling and, and all the rest of it. They, they, they could do all the stuff in civvies and everything else. And if I needed to, I'd go into civvies. But most of the time I acted as that um, face of everything, that liaison piece that, that, that was getting in there and got probably better results in many operational theaters than um, you're just having everything going through on the sneaky side. I, I don't know if the Americans uh, worked in, in that way as well. Well, I, I think we tend to um, try to be sneakier than we need to be. I, I, I'm more on your side where, you know, if I'm going to be in the field, I just assume that everybody assumes I'm a spy. And so yeah. I just say it. I'm like, yes, I am here to gather information. I want to understand who the bad people are. I want to understand yeah. what's going on, where you need help. I'm going to ask you questions. And if you don't want to ask, answer my question, don't. It's fine. You know, I'm not yeah. here to harm anybody. And so I just basically, basically my speech. And if they say, are you a spy? I say, yes, <laughs> I am. <laughs> and I'm here to help. How can I help yeah. you? What do you need yeah, help exa- with? You know? Exactly, exactly. Well, see, we, we refined our... Um, in particular, human intelligence operations in, in Northern Ireland. So we've got many, many, many years experience of you know, deep covert operations. Um, and in the end, it was the the intelligence operations and the intelligence penetration of the different terrorist organizations that brought them to um, what the military call the culminating point. And for those that are not military out there, the culminating point is where you have not necessarily been defeated militarily, but you can't do anything because everything you do can be countered the whole way through. And it, and it was our intelligence operations that had taken uh, both loyalist and Republican terrorist organizations to their culminating points, and, and they couldn't do anything. Every time someone tried to go out and do a shooting, um, they, they, they were intercepted by a, a police patrol. Every time they planted an explosive device to go off, for some reason or other, only the, de- only the detonator went off and the main charge didn't. Mm. Mm. Now, that, they should realize something that happened there. Every time they went off to do something else, 
you know, we, we knew about it before they knew about it. That shows the power of intelligence operations. And it, it meant that the different terrorist organizations, as, as people were sitting in meetings and planning the next activity, they didn't know when they were looking to the right or to the left whether the person that uh, they were sitting around that meeting with was actually an agent being run by military intelligence or the police intelligence or the security services uh-huh. and all the rest of it. And, and that level of mistrust built up even more mistrust uh, and caused the groups to start to fracture and fall apart, which is why they then decided to turn around and um, you reaffirm their, their desire to go down a political solution, a political route. Um, and it's you know, when, the, when the real history gets written, and it won't be in our lifetime, but right. when that gets written, it'll, it'll be fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And we took the lessons that we had from that and, and used those in deployments all around the world. That's also the same thing that basically happened in Berlin, just on a joint level, you know, where everybody was mm. watching everybody, including watching themselves. And yep. uh, I guess the folks there called it Berlinery. You know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and where there was so much reporting and investigation and intrigue and suspect that it was very hard to mount any kind of significant operation for any length yep. of time. Yeah. But there's, you know, the, the people think out there that um, you know all this is you know it's, it's either in the Hollywood movies or it's all gone it's all Cold War and it's all it's all past and everything else um you you, t- you take it up to the strategic level and they don't realize that this is going on on a daily basis yeah. all around us especially in our big cities anywhere where there's a military base you have got foreign intelligence services trying to find ways of penetrating it trying to get agents into it they're living within the communities that are on the place and i bet you some of the listeners here are laughing at this going uh, no there's no way that going on that that doesn't happen today uh, believe me folks it does well and the thing is is because we work at this j level you know the brits the canadians the aussies the new zealands the americans you know we're all a family and so if one of us gets in we all get in line and support that one asset that's that's working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was talking the other day to a former CIA station chief, and we were talking about... So we had one of our main senators here, a lady named Diane Feinstein, had a known Chinese spy working as her driver and her West Coast chief of staff. Yeah. And then they had the idea... When this all came out, Diane Feinstein and her staff said, oh, it's not a problem. Nothing happened. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh too loud. <laughs> hey, well, for for all the corporate people that are out there that are listening, you know, is, and when you're sitting there with your your cybersecurity monitoring your network and yes. um, it, making making sure that um, there's nothing going into your network and accessing files that shouldn't be accessed and downloading stuff that shouldn't be downloaded or putting stuff on that shouldn't be put on there. Um, uh, what they don't realize is the likes of you and I don't oh. give us stuff about the network. We're going to hack the person. Yes, we'll get someone who has got authorization to look at the particular files that we want, uh-huh. and we'll hack them, and we'll get them to deliver stuff to us in a way that it'll never be noticed by any bit of software that you've got. Absolutely. So, hey, folks, if you're responsible for your wider cybersecurity and you're not looking at your people as part of it, you're failing um, because we've already hacked you. Yeah, I don't care how long the <laughs> password is. If someone likes pussy or gambling or has a big ego, yep. I got him. Or you know the the, the the two that I put out when I, whenever I talk about this because I'm 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 now a sort of journalist working in working in this area. But um, I scare chief information security officers by turning around and um, giving a presentation and and saying I'm I'm hacking the computer that's here um, uh, and asking people to try and work out how they're going to do it. I've got authorization to give all this. I've got authorization to look at the presentation, to look at the spreadsheet, and I got a smartphone with top pocket. Um, the smartphone with a camera on it is recording what's on my screen, good old fashioned screen recording and transmitting it out somewhere else that no network's going to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no network security is going to pick up. And, and you know, it's, it's simple things like that. You know, if I, and if I want to hack the person, I'll, I'll hack the CEO's driver yeah. or I'll hack the, 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 uh, the CEO's PA who, you know, the CEO's driver, think of all those calls that are going out in the car where you've got something just connected into USB port in the car and picking the Bluetooth up from his phone. You're getting everything that you want out there. Or, or the PA, he's got access to every file because she has to check it before it goes in front of the, the CEO. Um, you know, if, if I walk in with a suitcase of cash and said, I'm paying your mortgage off cash, all I want you to do is do this. Yeah. Who's going to refuse that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's why, like, it's hard to laugh. It's hard not to laugh when they say, oh, nothing happened. For 20 yeah. years, this spy yeah. was embedded. Like, that's 
that gets you something more than an OBE at the end of the day. <laughs> oh God, yeah, yeah, very much so, <laughs> very much so. Well, there's you know there's 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 a book I've got in front of me here. Um, if if, if people want to look at it, and it's called The Spy and the Traitor, and it was written by a guy called Ben McIntyre, and it's one of the greatest espionage stories of the Cold War, and it's all about a, a Russian intelligence colonel uh, who was chief of KGB in London in 1985 called Colonel Oleg Gordievsky. Uh-huh. Now, G- Gordievsky was, you know, he, he, w- he was the head of the London station in, in, in 85. He had been recruited and was being run by MI6. Um, but uh, he, he'd, he'd, um, he's been credited with stopping um, what has come to the closest point of a nuclear exchange between the West and the East, um, and it wasn't during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was 1983. Wow. With a misinterpretation of a NATO exercise that was going on. Um, and the Russian premier at the time, Andropov, who was um, uh, absolutely paranoid about everything that was going on. Uh, and that was the time we had Ronald Reagan coming in and starting the Star Wars program. And that just reinforced the paranoia and, and everything else. Fantastic book. And, and you read that and you suddenly go, oh, my God, is that going on in the background? Hey, it is. It, it is. Well, it, it's just like with the problem with uh, North Korea, it, it's not a big problem for you guys over there in the UK immediately, but, you know, it's a problem because it's, it's a problem for the world and we'd like to think that we can make it a better place. So I was explaining to some of my friends, you know, when a carrier group shows up, it's not just a ship in the water. That's a, yeah. a lot. I mean, that ship is terrifying and you can't make it leave, but there's a lot of resources that come with that. And there are people oh, yes. like you and me probing looking for an opening and we may not find one in the first 2000 people we talk to, but we only need one opening. And if that person has placement and access again, look out. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, it is a relation to us because you know, UK is um, like, like the U S a, a, a global power. And I think the initial plans for the first operational deployment of our new Queen Elizabeth class carriers is, is down into Southeast Asia. And I suspect there'll be freedom of navigation through the South China Seas uh, as one of the tasks that they'll do in there. So um, it will certainly uh, rattle a few cages, I think. We, we've now got uh, U.S. Marine Corps F-35s fly, flying alongside U.K. F-35s off um, U.K. carriers. Um, and therefore, it's, it's properly a, a joint military capability. Um, that will be deployed out or, or, around the world, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see, you know, two nations operating so close together on uh, on on one particular platform for you know, the, the the safety of of the globe. Yeah, um, it, I want to get into that a little bit because okay, during our career, we went from I know I trained with a stubby pencil writing out reports, you know, <laughs> yeah. and and your career started a little before mine did, but but you know what that's like, and then it went to hey, you can carry a hard drive that wasn't a huge thing, like a portable hard drive, and that's how we were going to transmit reports. But the technology moved so fast, it was quickly, that's not how we're going to do it. We are going to do it electronically, and we can do it safely. You know, and taking pictures, now video, shoot, everybody can take pictures. Yeah. Everybody is really a spy. But getting that stuff to coordinate between two countries, and in our case, a, a group of countries, because, you know, the UK isn't just England. How, yeah. Talk a little bit about that evolution, because I find that stuff fascinating. Like the simple barriers, like to have two jets from two different countries landing on the same ship. That sounds easy, but let me tell you, like there's some big no, things no, no, no. that. Hey, well, there's you know, the, 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 we've got the standardization, and this on the the intelligence side of things. This always used to amuse me. Um, there's NATO standardization, and everyone talks about NATO and how important you know the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is. And one of the big things that it did very well was it brought out standard procedures that all NATO countries should use. Um, it brought out standard terminology so that um, we sh- we all should understand um, about what we're talking about. Um, but then um, we had all that, but then nations did their own thing. You know, the, the, the American map symbols that were used were not the NATO standard map, map symbols. So it meant we were still having to translate different languages between ourselves to to understand this this joint organisation, and and then you get that you, you mentioned technology, um, you know, the, whilst America was developing away from the stubby pencil into you know, the hard drive and, and electronic um, capability and putting together, um, the UK went backwards. In Northern Ireland, we had probably the a, a world leading and world beating 
integrated intelligence capability. But they never deployed it outside Northern Ireland, ever. So outside Northern Ireland, from an intelligence capability, the, our technological advance over the years was in um, the 1980s, um, the um, uh, uh, wax China graph that you could write on um, a, a piece of plastic that went over your map and draw your little symbols on it. Yeah. In the 1990s, that changed to uh, the felt tip wipeable Lumo color pen. Um, and uh, when it got into 2000, um, we managed to put some of those maps on PowerPoint and project them. And that was about the technological advances that we had in, in, in British intelligence. And it, it, it caused some real problems. I've got um, on, on my Grey Hair Media site, I've got, I've got a blog about uh, how the technology impacted when I was um, the head of intelligence in Iraq in um, 95, 96, uh, how, how the lack of our um, integrated capability it resulted in the deaths of um, you know, British soldiers, um, allied soldiers and, and locals because we had intelligence or we had information um, sitting there, but we didn't have the means and mechanisms to get it processed into intelligence quick enough yeah. to identify the threats and stop people getting killed and injured. And that, that, that hit me quite bad. You know, Iraq when it was there broke me um, because, because of the capabilities that we didn't have and I knew that we should have had. Um, and I lost some very, very good friends in it. So I've, I've done some, I've, I've done some interesting blogs on that because um, I've, I've got through that side of things now. Yeah, I mean, you know, when push comes to shove, we all think we're good at the job, and as long as we stay alive, we get to continue to claim that we are good at the job. Yeah. The reality is, it is exceptionally dangerous work, and it, um, you may be the best in the world, but if it's not your day, it's just not yep. your day. Yeah, well, it's it's exception to interest work, and and I don't think people realise the the level of responsibility that you got because you know I, I was chief of intelligence in a, in a couple of different theatres around the place. Um, the intelligence game, for those that don't understand it, is um, it's your job to predict what is going to happen, um, and you have to do it with what's given to you now. Now you hear all this in the press whenever an incident happens somewhere, and people look back on it and they they look back at it and they go, "Hey, that was an intelligence failure." You know, the Intel guys weren't doing the job right. And the argument that I say is um, it's fantastic when you've got 2020 hindsight yeah. and you know what's happened to work back from that and work out what could have been done better or what might have been wrong or what, what didn't. But actually, at the time, when you're looking forward, you're trying, you're trying to operate with 2020 foresight. And if we could do that, we'd all be winning the lottery every weekend. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a human activity. And it's very difficult to do that when you don't know what the outcome's going to be. You don't know what that jigsaw puzzle is. And someone has given you a 10 million piece jigsaw it's randomly put together. Uh, and actually, it's five 10 million piece jigsaws all stuck together um, and mixed up. And you're trying to build a picture out of it. Uh, unless you have something that focuses you, 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 it's very difficult to work out what that picture is. And that's where IT systems help. Um, but you know, we didn't have IT systems outside Northern Ireland, which was a, a real shame. Um, and that's where the Intel game is not only dangerous when you're out there doing the collecting and the ground and everything else, but the level of responsibility. And I, I used to feel as the chief of intelligence that it was my job. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And I, I used to feel as the chief of intelligence that it was my job to keep people alive, to stop incidents happening. Happening, and when they did, I, I, I took it very personally that we'd missed something. Mm -hmm. We'll go back over it in minute detail to try and find out what we'd missed, to learn the lessons, to change it, to get, make it better, so that you know people could survive the next time around. But it's it's a huge burden, huge burden. Yeah, it's a huge burden. There's a lot of legal requirements that you have to get right as well. And and yeah. I use the same exact analogy to say, look, you're asking me to solve a puzzle that I don't get to see the picture of. There's thousands of pieces. They have color on both sides. And like yep. you said, multi-thousand piece puzzles with other puzzles mixed in together. You may find something yep. that's beautiful and has nothing to do with anything from your point of view. It might fit perfectly in with some national level thing, but yep. it might not fit in with anything. <laughs> it, might, yep. it might really just be nothing, you know? 
But the, but the other the other thing we're having to fight, you know, as, as as professionals, you know, we 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 act as the conscience for those senior people that are out there, the planners, the generals, the politicians, and all the rest of them, who've got a preconceived in their in their mind as to what they think is happening, because everyone's got an opinion. Opinions are like certain parts of yeah. um, people's anatomy. Everyone's got one, and most of them are full of um, s- smelly stuff that comes out, um, yeah. uh, hopefully under under, under control. Um, uh, but those opinions, for, you know, formulate in, in senior people's minds. Um, and if you're coming up with a picture that goes against their opinion, you have to be strong enough um, to be able to argue your point to say, and this this person could be hugely more senior than you, um, to argue your point and say, look, no general, no senator, no MP, no prime minister. Uh, this is not what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. And have, have the balls to, to um, you know, go against what the group think is trying to force you to get good on. Again, yeah. that's really, really difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you're I mean, look, I mean, obviously, you know what you're doing because you're saying the same things I say and, and we've never met <laughs> until today, but I totally agree. This stuff is exceptionally hard, dangerous work. And uh, in some way, so our, our president said that he didn't want to hear briefings from the CIA anymore. And I absolutely get that because <laughs> like you were kind of alluding to yeah. pe- people have their pet analysis piece that they like. And they will sell it hard, and they're well credentialed. Yeah. They're convincing, yeah. And they might be utterly and completely not might be often are utterly and completely wrong. Yeah. Oh, I you know I, classic example of that. I'd just been promoted to in in U.S. terms, bird colonel. Um, I was in um, a big uh, multinational headquarters. The commander was British, three star general. His chief of staff was British, two star general. And um, every week, the, the, the headquarters just come back from Afghanistan. I hadn't actually been to Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, they asked for an intelligence briefing for all the generals from all the different nations uh, as they come back. Uh, and they wanted Afghanistan to be focused on so they could keep up to speed with uh, everything that had gone on and any changes that were coming in. And this was just at a time when the, the, the Taliban used to carry out traditional military operations. They would um, close with and fight their enemy in conventional military tactics. So they, they'd carry out squad level attacks, company level attacks, um, using small arms with, with a, a little bit of indirect fire um, as support. So mortars coming in to support them. But, but they were very traditional in their military approach to things. But every time they attacked NATO um, and the allied forces that were in there, they get hammered. Because we'd got long-range artillery, we'd got air power, we'd got attack helicopters, we'd got better support weapons and machine guns and all the rest of it. So they'd get decimated. Um, and we'd picked up on the intelligence game uh, that they had, uh, the Taliban had gone off to Hamas and had got some expertise from Hamas and making improvised explosive devices and were starting to change their tactics. Um, and we're, start, we're, we're going to start to bring in um, off-route improvised explosive devices and, and, and use those. And I remember briefing it to the, 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 the general one day, and I was relatively new in the headquarters. And I said, General, we're picking up these indications that um, you know, Taliban are going to start changing the tactics. They're going to start using improvised explosive devices, off-route mines, all the rest of it. We don't think they're going to go down the suicide bomb route unless they recruit external people to do that, because that's outside their psychology. But, but this is going to come in. It's going to come in relatively soon. And, and as I said that, he stood up, and he got his diary in his hand, and he threw it at me. Yeah, this was a two-star general, threw it at a bird colonel, um, and it, it, it hit my feet. And he said, Ingram, I've been there, you haven't. Um, that will never happen. I oh, don't man. want any more defeatist J2 briefings from you ever. And he stormed out. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, shit. Oh, well, that, 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 that's the end of a career then. And, <laughs> you know, I, I keep, I keep you know, I'd, if it wasn't such a serious point, I would, if I came across him again, go, hey, general, I told you so. But there's the number of lives that I told you so it's cost. Listen to what your J2 is saying. Uh, and he, he was you know, a typical uh, individual that you come across from time to time who's made his own mind up as to what he thinks is going to happen. Um, and no matter what else is out there, he doesn't care. Um, that's what we have to deal with, folks. Yeah, well, and so many times in that guy's career, he's actually been right because he's dealt with younger folks who, who don't necessarily have what it takes to get the right answer. But yep. and, and plenty of times he's probably been 100 percent correct. Oh, yeah. One of the things that I learned to ask is sort of my meter when I went and worked at battalion and below was 
to ask the two, and, and for the audience, the intelligence guy, the main intelligence officer in a battalion or below is is in their early 20s, maybe mid-20s. These are, these are yeah. not yeah. new people because they've had a lot of experience in those first four or five, six years, but these, these are younger guys. And so when you go to ask and you say, hey, um, how accurate do you think your picture is right now? If it was anything <laughs> north yeah. of 60%, Philip. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'd be going, oh, well, fantastic. Oh, well. And I, I, always, I, I, I always used to use the adage, you know, Sixty percent now is better than one hundred percent never. Um, yeah. But but um, I'm giving you the picture. I'm giving you the assessment. I'm giving you how accurate I think it is. Um, it's now you as the boss who um, is wearing so much more rank to um, make your call and what you're going to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll always try and get it better, but but um, I, I might not be able to do that. And you have to recognize that it might be impossible to get a better picture. Well, um, and then I, one of the things I always <laughs> noticed, and, and look, I've deployed a lot. I had the uh, the. the the fortune of staying out and really getting great at field work. Yeah. The separation between crime survival, like let's call it extra legal activity and actual yeah. nefarious intent towards people. Yeah. It's hard to sort that out. It, it's, it's, it's very hard. Um, and it's very hard in many cases because you're, you're, you're working in a very gray area legally the advice isn't always there and it's we're, we're we're suffering this in the uh, you know, the british veterans community at the moment where um there are legal teams looking back at operations and they're applying 2020 hindsight and they're taking veterans and they're prosecuting them for things that happened um on the spare of the moment you know sometimes 40 years ago and and trying to say but you made that decision uh, and therefore that met, you you must have had that intent um, yeah, I can't remember 40 days ago. Well, the, the, the wine's very good. Um, yeah. Never mind 40 years ago. So, <laughs> yeah. but 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 the, you know the pressure the pressure on people who've been through your really difficult times to to be able to do that and and to give the the the, the people a fair trial, but also for those that are victims out there um, who are, are are potentially looking for someone to blame to to give them. You know, closure. I don't think it's ever going to happen, and um, it's 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 a it's a difficulty that doesn't seem to happen in the states. You know, one 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 thing President Trump does seem to do is is look after uh, his, his military veterans community. Um, in some ways, arguably, he's done some harm to the wider community in some of the decisions he's made. But um, he's uh, he, at least he's gone one way. Yeah, yeah. And there has to be a correction the other direction, and there have to you know we we if you haven't noticed, we like to bang left and right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, how are we as a partner? I mean, given given the crazy, like our nation is built, and and yours guys, you guys are kind of the same way with Parliament. You guys can actually be a lot more cataclysmic than we are, but um, we figure things out by not doing anything and having a fight until we're sick of fighting, and then we agree, and then we pick a new fight. Yeah, I, I think I think there's different levels of partnership that's there. I think there's there's something we talk of from from the UK side, and I don't know whether this is talked about in the in the states, but it's it's called the special relationship, and the special relationship is between the UK and the US, and and that comes in from you know the relationship that was developed started in the First World War, developed in the Second World War, even before America came into um, the, the the war formally, it was um, an intelligence sharing relationship first and foremost. You know, a lot of the Enigma traffic that uh, the, the Brits were intercepting. A lot of the technology that there was behind that um, it was being shared uh, across the states. You know, Enigma intercept of pre-Pearl Harbor stuff was, was, was shared. It's just it was at a weekend uh, when there was a national holiday and um, everything, everything else meant that it, it, it actually didn't get to the decision makers in time. And the, the Lend-Lease program that came in bringing um, US manufactured um, war machinery across the Atlantic to, to help uh, the UK uh, and all this, and that special relationship uh, you, uh, has been built on a wider intelligence relationship that uh, is never going to go away. And, and we've now got shared capabilities across across the globe that the US can't replicate in any way. The UK couldn't replicate in any yeah. way, uh-uh. and our other our, our other Five Eyes partners couldn't replicate in any way. And again, I, I like doing books. There's there's another book out there if any of your listeners wanted to. Um, uh, read it. It's called Intercept: The Secret History of Computers and Spies, and it's by a guy called Gordon Carrera, who is the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation, um, security correspondent. 
but it is the most brilliant book I have ever come across on um, uh, wider um, intelligence history. Um, and it starts off with um, making people understand that the computer that was out there, the name the computer, uh, was, was actually the name of uh, an analyst's, a mathematical analyst's post in uh, the British MOD uh, in uh, 1912. Huh. And the, com the computer was there to calculate uh, ballistic trajectories for artillery pieces. And, and their job title was computer. And that's what's got um, adapted into you know, what you and I are talking over at the moment. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, and so much of it is so up to date today. Um, it's, it, it, it gives a real understanding and, and again opens people's eyes and you go, oh my God, is that going on? Yeah. The, we just learned a lot about that from our movie about the Apollo, the latest Apollo uh, space land, moon landing. Oh yeah. It came out and it had the, um, the, the African-American ladies that worked in a pool of computers and they figured out launch trajectories. Yep. You know, the math was yep. known. So if you could do the math, you could have a job until yep. actual computers took over people yep. in the in in the heart of it had actual slide rules as the as the yeah. rocket is in the air <laughs> and they're doing slide rule math you know in real time it's crazy well yeah and, and, and that, the moonlander I've, I've, i'm probably getting this vastly wrong but the um, the power of the computing system that was in it is um uh a fraction of the power that's in the, the pocket calculator that would be sitting on your desk today. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it, it's totally true. Everybody, by the way, this is Philip Ingram from Gray Hair Media, Gray with the uh, English spelling. So G R E Y hairmedia.com. You can get him on Twitter at Philip I N G M B E. And if not, then Pete A. Turner, and I'll, I'll link you guys together. Obviously, he knows what he's doing and everything else. Um, it freaks people out that I tell them that I'm a spy. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I, for one, I'm not doing the job. But two, yep. again, the way I approach things, I work on trust. And if I'm going to yep. be trustworthy, I've got to be honest. What are your thoughts? Uh, I agree completely. You know, on my Twitter handle, it says I'm an ex-spook. Um, uh -huh. And I, and I put it up there, and I I do quite a lot of. You, you can probably tell from the accent. Um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland, um, and uh, I do quite a lot of broadcasting into Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's it doesn't come out uh, come without its risks. It's still a stated aim of uh, certain terrorist organisations that uh, are have supposedly been disbanded, but they still have current aims to um, capture, torture, and kill uh, a current or former member of British intelligence because of uh, it was in there. So. Um, but 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 like you, I feel it's it's important to put your credentials out openly, and I did that operationally. Um, I, I, I did that whilst I was serving. I've, I've done that since since I've come out because it allows me then um, and, and anyone who reads or listens to the stuff that I do, um, it, it allows them to understand where I'm coming from, and hopefully that um, in in some occasions um, I I might actually know a little bit about what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> maybe possibly <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about okay so as a guy that's collected in the field you do you become an 06 uh, or from our point of view an 06 yep. a, a full bird colonel um, your detachment from the ground you know it doesn't get better as you get higher ranked how did you work to keep relevant to the field collection and, you know, and the enormous task of, of really being a, a lot yeah. of, so just for the audience's sake, when you're at the very tip of the spear and, and you're, and I say this because you're going out every day and all you're focused on is what is in front of you that day, that minute, maybe the next day, maybe the next day, probably not. Yeah. You worry about that when you come back. That person is their own ops person, their own logistician, their own report writer, their own everything. And it is an enormous load to put on a collector to have them out there alone because the information doesn't come back down to them, just taskings, do this, do this. Yep. You send reports out into the blind and you never hear anything back. So how do you, Philip, how do you keep track of, of what that reality is as you become a, a captain, a major, a, cur a colonel, a, a full colonel? Well, you, you, you do it by getting out in the ground with the boys and girls that are um, uh, you know, working it. And also, there are certain operations where um, either the political risk or, in some cases, the physical risk is, is such that um, it's inappropriate for you to tell other people to do it. And it's, it's more appropriate. And it's more with the political risk. You, it's more appropriate for you to get out and do it. You know, I remember as a, as a major 
going out on the ground in one particular country, and I have to be careful, don't give, don't give the details away, but right. uh, on the ground, one particular country where things were not as stable as they, as they, as they should have been, and um, having to go into this uh, political headquarters, and it was, a, it was a rival political party to the, one of the main mooring groups that was there. So there was f- friction between them. Uh, and I was going in with a small sidearm. I had my driver with me, um, usually, if we're putting humid operations out on that, I'd, I'd have had a backup um, uh, set of uh, human intelligence specialists fairly close by, covertly ready to come in and, and extract if necessary, and then an outer cordon around them from uh, an infantry unit that would be providing that. But this was uh, a particularly sensitive operation where we, could, we couldn't have people knowing about that, and, and therefore I was in walking into this headquarters to go and see uh, this particular individual. Um, and I remember his guard stopped my driver coming with me. My driver is the only one with a, a, a long barrel weapon. Um, uh, so he was held outside and um, they wouldn't allow interpreters in. So I was walking down these corridors with all these hoods with AK-47s and, and, and a lot more. Uh, t- been taken into this little room where I didn't know where it was. Communications was non-existent. You know, we could, we, there was no direct communications back into headquarters. Um, the, the chances of me being able to get a mobile telephone out and get a mobile telephone signal and get a phone call out before something had happened would be zero. Yeah. And, and you're, 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 just, you're just having to you know, fly by the seat of your pants. And, and because your guys and girls that work for you and you're working with know that you do that and see that you do that, you've got that credibility. You know, it's maintaining that credibility and, and it's, it's getting to know everyone from a personal perspective. You, know, you, you, you don't, the, the, the intelligence game, the, the soldiers, um, the men and women that you're dealing with, you don't treat them in the same way that you treat any other soldiers in any other unit. You, 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 you really get to know people and, and people get to know you and they know um, everything about you and that you, you become uh, uh, your good mates, good friends. Um, you eat, sleep, drink, you work hard together so that you, 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 you get that common bond, that common understanding. And it, it's really it, leadership within, with personnel from um, you know, the, the intel side of things is, is hugely different to leadership in an infantry unit where infantry unit, you tell people to do something and you want them to do it without question because the bullets are zipping in around you and you need people to run at the machine gun when you say run at the machine gun. Well, on the intel side, you need people to do that, but you have to, they have to know that whenever you say that, you've thought through every uh, eventuality that's there. Um, they are not in a position uh, to question it because they would question it. And I've, 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 I've sat there and um, when I was having orders groups and bits and pieces, had some of my most junior soldiers um, question um, you know, my thinking. And I, I'd, I'd quite happily, instead of going, you don't do that in the military, son, um, uh, quite happily explain my thinking behind it and run through the logic and have a logic argument with them where there was time to do that so that they get the confidence that the, the decisions were coming out were the right ones. It's, it's hard work. Uh, but you know, when you're dealing with bright people and you're dealing with bright people in difficult um, situations, um, it's really important that you get down, uh, down and dirty with them and, and understand them as people. Boy, that is such a great point. Like we we could just spend an hour talking about that because you do you, you test these folks, you expect them to, and you and I both know this. You have to self develop into becoming a great yeah. spy. It, it's not yeah. taught at the schoolhouse. Yeah, you can go to a course here and there, but to really do it, you've got to constantly improve. And so you demand a lot mentally, uh, you know, and cognitively of these people. And then if you undermine their intelligence all the time and treat them like they're yeah. stupid, well, they're, yeah. they're, now they're smarter than you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and they will cut your throat by just be like, oh, yeah? All right, motherfucker. Here's how we're going to do this, you know? <laughs> well, exactly. That's, that's why I, was, I thought um, we, there a, used to be a fantastic television series in the UK um, called Yes, Prime Minister. Uh-huh. Um, and, and in it, we had the, the archetypical British civil servant who was um, the head of the civil service uh, reminding the prime minister about things. And he, he was called Sir Humphrey. The prime minister would, would, would say he's going to go off and do this. And Sir Humphrey would turn around and say, ah, prime minister, that's a very brave decision. 
which is which is coded UK civil service speak for you're being an absolute and utter idiot. I wouldn't do that if you paid me a million dollars to do it. <laughs> um, but 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 it is it, is is that sort of thing when when we're. You know, my soldiers would um, very quickly turn around and, and they wouldn't say to me, that's a very brave decision, boss. They'd, uh, they'd go, you what? And, and they'd, argue, <laughs> they'd, they'd, they'd argue with me. And they'd probably throw a few expletives in there as well. And um, you also have to have the humility that if you have got your logic wrong, um, to turn around in front of them and say, actually, folks, no, you've convinced me. I got that wrong. And, and you change your mind. Um, again, from a command perspective, especially in a hierarchical organization like the military, that's, that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing about that, too, is is your way to do this might be right. My way to do this might be right. And sometimes yeah. as a commander, you've got to let go of the micromanagement part, and say, especially yeah. if the person is the collector. It, one yeah. thing that the audience probably doesn't know is, is when we go out, if Philip and I were to go out and it was my day, I would own the mission that day. It doesn't matter if you outrank me or not. And his job is to sit there, shut up, take notes, maybe poke in a question here and there, but mostly he's going to shut up and let me do what I do. So we all get to experience each other's uh, judo as we, as it were. Yeah. No, I had had a brilliant, when I was company commander, a brilliant Sergeant Major. Um, And uh, I'd, 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 I'd say, uh, right. And his his nickname was Mort. I'd say Mort. um, uh, We wanted to go, we need to go from A to B. And um, you know, we'd be standing at A and I'd be looking at B. And he'd go, yes, boss. All of a sudden, he disappeared disappear behind me. And I'd go, where the bloody hell is he gone? Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I'd look around again and he'd be standing at B, having achieved twice as much as it needed him to achieve and getting there. And I hadn't got a clue how he'd got to it. But hey, that's, <laughs> you, 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 you're dealing with some special people and, and they, they might think and operate in a different way to you've worked it out. Embrace it. Um, embrace people's strengths and, and understand where they can add. Um, and I think in the Intel community, we're, we're very good at that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is I had my commander who was, who worked with me in Bosnia. Uh, he took over mid mid tour or during the tour. And so, um, I really didn't get a chance to ever interact with him much, but our unit was kind of poisoned by the previous commander. And, and I told him that we've had him on the show and we've talked about that. And I asked him, you've got a bunch of counterintelligence assets all scattered all over the, the Bosnian countryside. You're not commanding anything, you know, like you, you really have no control over what we do because there's just no way to control it. And what a different way to command something. And there's, and there's no one above us that can't command us any better. You know, like we were working for a medical unit, that, that surgeon that runs that medical unit, they, they can't control what we do, you know? Exactly. And so how does, how does one lead a unit like that? That's literally a bunch of cats. Well, it, leadership comes comes in so many different ways. You know, um, theoretically, it's very difficult to herd cats, but practically, you have to learn how to do it. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, if you if you're wandering around uh, smelling of the best quality fish, um, uh, looking as preened as you can be, um, with the credibility that you're the top cat. Um, well, hey, the top top cat, even in the cartoons, was the leader, and he, he got the other cats to follow him. So you have to just you know, find out what the recipe is in your particular unit and and, and do that. Yeah, when I, when I was a, an, a, an Intel battalion commander, we used to do every Friday afternoon would have would have commanding officers um, the commanding officers run, and you know we'd we'd go out for a run uh, the whole battalion out, out through the woods. And my only instruction to our PT instructors was, if you hear people not talking, then you're going too fast. Mm-hmm. Slow it down, because yeah. I wanted everyone out of their their little. Um, rabbit hutches and pigeonholes and all the rest of it to get together and start to chew the cud and, and swap the stories and, and get to know what's it, uh, what was happening. And we then finished the run at the end of the Friday at um, what, what we called the Battalion Welfare Facility. Um, that was a covert part of my um, human company's um, headquarters. Uh, and outside that, we had barbecues. We, uh, we had a couple of kids' playrooms in there. Um, uh, all the families were invited up to it. We do this every Friday religiously. Um, and if people could make it, they could make it. If they couldn't make it, yeah, we'll, we'll find yeah, that, that wasn't a problem. But we'd have a couple of hours of of welfare and downtime, and your know, rank went out the window. And uh, you, know, the, you know, I, I had the confidence with with um, my teams to you know, talk to people in first name terms, um, and and really get to know people and get to know uh, their families and and everything else. And you know, my battalion had the first um, gay marriage between two 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 girls and, and they were welcomed in by all the rest of the families that were there yeah. um, and and even when they had a child 
don't ask me the technicalities, but even when they had a child, um, you know, they, they were welcomed in as a, as a family with a child and all the rest of it. And, it, and I, nobody had to tell people to do that. Nobody had to you know, put any instructions that were out there. That's just the atmosphere that we had. And I, that's, you know, that's not just down to me. That's down to uh, all of the other um, company commanders sure. and the commanders of the base. And, and me being given the freedom by my boss to, to allow that sort of um, uh, command style and leadership style. And, that, and it worked really well but that wouldn't work for other units. Yeah, 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 for sure. One of the things that I, uh, I'm a champion of, at least in terms of the American military, is I'm totally fine with really ultimately anybody. I, I don't care if you're gay. I don't yeah. care if you're a woman. I, I don't care if you're trans. As long as you're either willing, either you are a pro or willing to shut up and learn how to become a pro, yep. you know, then yeah. I, I, I don't care. And if you think only dudes can fight, because of PT tests, I always say this, and it's always true. No one has ever asked me to do a push-up during a combat patrol. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Never been a requirement. And, exactly. and as you were saying earlier, like with the whole running thing, when you get to an obstacle as a unit, especially in a place like Afghanistan, if you're on a foot patrol, you move over that obstacle as deliberately and quickly as you can, but there is a balance between deliberate and, and fast. Yeah. Because... Yeah. And, and and no one no one is doing anything hard on their own. There is at least help offered. So if you're jumping over a ditch or climbing over a fence, yeah. you do it as a team. You don't do it as men, and then the women are screwed because they can't get over a thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and when it comes to the skill sets and all the rest of it, so probably forty percent of my battalion was was uh, female. Um, one of the best interrogators I had in the battalion was my adjutant. Um, you know, I remember in Iraq, I, I got two big sergeant majors were interrogating these this pair that we'd picked up with a huge weapons cache. They'd been responsible for a, a couple of attacks that we knew of, um, really dangerous guys. And um, the two sergeant majors were having real difficulty getting any information out of them. So we switched tactics. And I, I put my adjutant, who was, who was you know, five foot two in, uh, in her boots, um, blonde from Edinburgh and Scotland, very slightly built, but um, boy, could she run and could she lift stuff and, and, and take things anywhere. And, and she, she went down and led, led the interrogation the next day. Um, it took her about 35 minutes to get these two guys singing. They, they told her everything. So you're saying she couldn't be a warrior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. She, 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 she was a warrior and a half. Yeah, <laughs> she, yeah she, I've she, seen she, the same uh, thing. I've, and fearless. You yeah. know, and people that suck, they suck and, and they need to be led better so they cannot suck. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, if, again, if you're a pro or willing to become one, I got I got time. I got time and, yeah. and you can ride oh, yeah. with me anytime. So and, and, and we, we, we've, we've had our women and our special forces units uh, on the intel side before the, the, the rest of special duties was, was, was opened up. Special forces was opened up for, for many, many years, including in Northern Ireland and very, very successful, very hard women. Um, but not in a nasty way. Nice people, very nice people. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I happily embrace anyone doing anything, provided everyone's coming at it, uh, you know, with 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 a hundred percent effort because we're a team. Let me ask you this, and this is sort of a, you know, a more of a figurative than a literal question, but I've always found that I had to spend more time managing us, spent more time on our end of the equation. <laughs> yeah. Was I was killed more time, and I've literally been fired, been kicked out of theater, been, you know, been virtually stabbed to death in the staff room ever, way more than I ever was in combat. Would you agree? Um, yes. We're, you know, the pe people didn't like... Um, you know, us intel weenies um we were always seen as different we're always seen as not 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 quite military enough uh, we're always seen as too military at times uh, too too sneaky or then not sneaky enough because they expect it was you know people just didn't trust us um and uh you know senior officers were almost scared of in many cases the the intelligence of you know junior non-commissioned officers um you know i had i remember doing a passing out parade at our intelligence training center uh, at chick sounds in bedfordshire which is uh, an old 12th century Gilbertine priory that is a grade one listed scheduled ancient monument in the UK because there is only one of them in the world, huh. um, uh, highly protected. But one, one of the junior soldiers that was passing out uh, on, the, on the day I did the parade um, uh, was a PhD 
He'd, he'd, he'd been teaching at university for eight years before he said, oh, to hell with this, I'm going to join the military. Yeah. <laughs> so so I'd, I'd Lance Corporal Doctor. <laughs> and and you're, you're, dealing, you're dealing with people at that level. It's fantastic. It, real privilege, real honor. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, it's an honor for me to have you on the show. I, um, I love, I just love these kind of chats that illustrate the Intel world at a level that's not sensational, but look how fucking terrifying it is what we have to do on a day-to-day basis and how hard it is. It's uh, it's great to have these conversations, Philip. I really appreciate you. Exactly, uh, but it's been a real privilege being the show and I've, I've loved talking to you.